microphone so we can get started. All right, I want to rush us into starting because we have two, in a way, almost two presentations tonight. I, I want to first apologize and thank Bruce for allowing somebody to kind of piggyback on his very important utopian vision we're going to be hearing about the local and global in, in Jerusalem. Um, we also have with us uh, Menachem Klein uh, visiting from, we were able to grab him from a series of peace events in the United States, and he changed his travel plans to stay next to the United States, and so we have a full program. So let me say a little something about the evening and about both of our speakers. Um, the, here we are, the last week of the city's uh, against nationalism seminar, we, as I mentioned last week, kind of started moving towards the global more conscientiously, trying to think about the ways in which understanding the global context or changes in globalization may offer a new way of thinking about uh, peacemaking in cities. And uh, along those lines, we asked Bruce Muslish, who's a professor of history here at MIT, who has worked extensively on the history, global history and globalization from the historical perspective to be our final speaker. His, the title of his talk is The Local and Global in um, Jerusalem. I should also say that in addition to his recent work in writing on global history, he is the author of The Uncertain Sciences, The Fourth Discontinuity, um, the, uh, A New Science, The Breakdown of Connections and the Birth of Sociology. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, the recipient of the Toynbee Prize, which is an international award in social science, and just an expert in historical methodology, psychohistory, and social history. Um, after Bruce speaks to, oh, tonight, and I, I, I beg your uh, 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 accommodation in our schedule, but we will have speakers up until probably 7, and then we'll allow a half an hour for comments. So I know normally we go past 7 anyway, but I want to prepare you in advance, and we'll probably go till 7 30. We don't want to lose the opportunity of, um, to ask questions of both of our speakers. After uh, Professor Maslich speaks, we will have Dr. Menachem Klein, a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Bar Ilan University. And he's also a senior research fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Israel Studies. Dr. Klein is a board member of Beth Salem, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. In 2000, he was an external um, expert advisor for Jerusalem Affairs and Israel PLO Final Status Talks to the Minister of Internal Interior Security and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was also a member of the political advisory team operating in the office of Prime Minister Barak. Um, he's been involved in many of uh, uh, unofficial negotiations with Palestinian counterparts, and most recently, in October 2003, he signed together with prominent Israeli analysts and Palestinian negotiators the Geneva Understanding, what we know as the Geneva Accord, responsible largely for the, the uh, component on Jerusalem. So we are very excited to see him today. I just want to also mention that he's the author of two books that are very central to our project. One the earliest, Jerusalem, the Contested City, which we have here at MIT, and the second, the newest book, The Jerusalem Problem, The Struggle for Permanent Status, uh, which we have on the stellar site a couple of the chapters of, which includes a vision for Jerusalem in, uh, in, the, in the future. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Bruce. Hopefully, 45 minutes, and then we'll move on to Oops. Well, I need to start with an apologia on two counts. One, when Diane Davis first asked if I would uh, participate in the series, uh, I said I know nothing about Jerusalem, more or less, but I would do a crash course. And on the city, I know a little more, but not all that much, and I would do a crash course. But I, got a, uh, I, I became sick. And so the only crash that will occur is probably what I'm going to be doing now. Um, so there are two grounds for my apologia. Uh, one, uh, the illness, and two, uh, the lack of knowledge. Globalization is something I do think I know something about. So I'm going to start talking about that. Um, I had planned to come to all of the talks, being a responsible citizen. Uh, I did make it to the first one, Gerald Frug. Uh, and then I got sick. 
So I hope that at least there, that there'll be some suggestions and questions that uh, will emerge from what I, I say. I'm going to talk on three topics, each one of which deserves 45 minutes. Um, one is globalization, the other is the global city, and the third is Jerusalem. So let me start by saying something about globalization as seen from an historical perspective. For about the last 12 years, a number of us have been working on the, what's called the New Global History Initiative. Uh, had a number of international conferences and other things. I'll give you the website if you want it. Now, when we say history, we have in mind an interdisciplinary uh, approach. Uh, the starting point, if you're going to be talking about globalization, is to avoid evaluation. You know, I'm anti-globalization or I'm pro-globalization. That, that's simply the wrong way of going about it. What we've tried to do is some empirical work, some theoretical reflection, and to go back and forth between them. Let me give you some provisional definitions of globalization. One is by an historian named uh, C.A. Bailey. And he says, globalization is, quote, a progressive increase in the scale of social processes from a local to a regional to a world level. Um, then there's a sociologist named Sylvia Walby, and she speaks of it as, quote, a process of increased density and frequency of international or global interactions relative to local or national ones. And then she fleshes out the definition by saying, its causes are the increased power of global capital markets, the rise of new information and communication technologies, and the rise of a new hegemon, which creates the condition for increased trade. Um, I'm going to offer a, a different definition in a moment. But notice that uh, both these speak in terms of transcending uh, the established boundaries, and primarily the nation state. Because for the last two or 300 years, that has been uh, the boundary problem, and globalization is a means of transcending that. Incidentally, there's great confusion between what's called world history, some of you may have heard of that, global history, and now new global history. Let me bypass that. That's a problem for historians. So when I'm talking about globalization, I'm basically talking about its present day phase which means post-World War II. And I think a number of factors came together in the 30, 40 years after the end of World War II, which has made for a new, uh, a new world in which we're existing, which indeed needs to be called a global epic at this point. So what are these factors? First is the step into space. Think about it for a moment. We don't really think very much about it, but it's an absolutely extraordinary event in the history of the human species. If a natural historian were observing you know, an animal that suddenly took off, had wings, they'd say it's another species. We're the same species, but we're entering upon a whole new stage. And it gives us a perspective, a vision of the Earth, which we'd only had before in our imagination. Now you can actually see spaceship Earth. So, Indeed, for me, globalization, bottom line, you know, it's not just economic, political, social, cultural, it's all of those two. It's a change in consciousness, and we're at the beginning of, of that. Okay, so you've got to step into space. Next, you have the satellites, and they make for instantaneous time-space communication. An enormous compression of time and space. Obviously, it's been going on for the last two or three hundred years. I mean, you can obviously think of telegraphs, and railroads, and this, that, and the other thing. But this allows for instantaneous economic and other activity, as you, I'm sure, know. So, the satellites. Nuclear. That power transcends national boundaries. Uh, and it does so, by the way, even peacefully. We think of Chernob Chernobyl. And it does, of course, in a military uh, sense. We've been lucky so far. Now, from those satellites, you see the Earth, and you realize that the environmental problem transcends national boundaries. So that's another factor uh, that we have to uh, bear in mind. Those satellites, again, I don't want to hang it all on satellites, facilitate the growth of the multinational corporations. 
I mean, it's a major feature of globalization. Some people think globalization is just economic. Uh, and they say, ah, well, there was as much foreign direct investment at the end of the 19th century by Britain as there is today. That, that's so simplistic and uh, lacking in a, a, an idea of the whole, uh, which you have to have here. But in any case, we had a conference called Mapping the Multinational Corporations. And when we started, by the way, if I had a chalk, I'd draw it this way. That's the curve. Starting in 1600, Dutch and East India Company, very slow growth, and then suddenly explosion. When we started in 1998 to give visual representation to these new leviathans, there were about 53,000. When we finished in 2000, there were 63,000 and counting. So, you know, their power is, is, is to be reckoned with, definitely. Okay, multinational corporations. Another is, of course, the NGOs. And by the way, the curve, as best I can tell, because we're, we've got a project now to map them, is an identical curve, although it starts much, much later, of course. So you have to reckon with the N NGOs. And then you have such factors as human rights, world music, world architecture, a whole host of other uh, factors. And without going into any detail on into them, I want simply to say that they have a synergy and they're synchronistic in a way that we've never experienced before. And therefore, you have to look at globalization in a holistic manner. Um, I said that it, mainly this phase of globalization starts after World War II. Uh, obviously, the Cold War plays a role because you have two competing powers, each with its, I wouldn't want to call it a global vision, but certainly an international vision. And you know uh, that one of them is no longer on the stage. Okay, so in trying to anticipate further questions, let me just categorically make two or three points. One is that globalization is not another word for Americanization. That is one of the gross simplicities. Nor is it another word for imperialism. Not that both of these don't play a role, obviously. But it's far, far more complicated than just saying it's Americanization. Next, globalization is not just Western. In those multinational corporations I mentioned 25 years ago, 30 years ago, they were almost all European or American. As of today, 172 of them are Asian. So that's, Japan is pushing globalization as much and perhaps even more than the United States of America. Last point on globalization. People talk about homogenization. Uh, and again, uh, this ignores the fact that yes, some homogenization is taking place, but so is heterogeneity. So in all of these questions, one has to ask how much homogenization where, how, etc. And the same thing with the imperialism and the Americanization. So, having rushed through the last 50, 60 years and all of globalization, I see a grin on Diane's face. I, I'm staying within time, I trust. Um, let me now say, well, all right, how do we apply any of this to the city? And you'll see that that curve I sp spoke of, the MNCs and NGOs went up, the curve of my knowledge will now go down. Um, one of the projects we had in this initiative was um, to look at globalization in the city. And there was a conference in St. Petersburg. Question was, was St. Petersburg a global city? Uh, how could it be one if it wanted to? That got short-circuited because the St. Petersburgians really don't want to be global. But that's, that's another story. Okay. Globalization and the city. Hunter-gatherers, which is about 99% of the human species existence, can be thought of as globalizing. They were wandering across the globe. I think that's a very shallow definition, but it is one that's sometimes used. And then, of course, as you know, about 12,000 years ago, um, our species began to put down roots uh, in settlements, agricultural settlements. And therefore, you have cities, beginning of cities. And with cities, 
the beginning of what we have come to call civilization, which, by the way, happens to be very, very late neologism, but that's another story. There's a famous book, perhaps unknown by now, called The Ancient City by Fustel de Collange. Anybody ever heard of it? Well, such is fame, fleeting. Um, it was published in 1864, and he claims that the city is based on religion. He's obviously thinking of the Western civilization, basically on, of, of Rome, um, and that the founding of the city is, in fact, a religious act. Uh, and it's important to bear that in mind. He, d he goes on to say, it was then enlarged by philosophy on one hand, side, the cosmopolitan you know, Stoics and, uh, well, the original uh, uh, Greek philosophers who then uh, had a vision of cosmopolitanism. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, Christianity, which claimed to transcend the local religion, if you will, uh, with this universal uh, one. And that ended ancient society for Fustel de Collange. Now, with that in mind, I want to run this little formula by you, which is that the sacral idea of place, which figures largely in discussions among urban, urbanists and architects and such like, I gather, has been challenged by the conception of a value-neutral, mathematical, uh, space-oriented, space-governed uh, notion uh, operating on mathematical principles. And I, you know, I, I warned against polarity, it's kind of simple polarities, but this one I think is, is uh, uh, fecund, it has uh, possibilities here. Let me just read a quote from um, D.H. Lawrence. Uh, so I pay my dues to the people who believe in place rather than space. Uh, in his studies in classic American literature, which should be read by everyone, by the way, uh, especially now when, as we all know, Americans uh, are nonviolent, read D.H. Read Lawrence. But he says, quote, every continent has its own great spirit of place. Every people is polarized in some particular loca locality, which is home, the homeland. Different places on the face of the earth have different vital effluence, different vibration, difficult, different, different chemical exhalation, different polarity with different stars. Call it what you like. But the spirit of place is a great reality. Now, of course, he's talking about continent. We're going to be talking about history. Um, Collapsing an enormous story, one might argue that history is the story of increased urbanization from that start about 12,000 years ago. Um, I'm going to jump to 1851. You may be familiar with all this material, but let, let me present it. When Great Britain had a census which showed that over half of its population was no longer living in rural circumstances, but in urban circumstances. And now this has become, of course, worldwide or global. It is estimated that by 2030, two-thirds of the world's population will be urban. So it's a major, major part of history. Now, again, as I'm sure you all know, in the course of history, cities have had different functions. Some have been mainly political, some ecclesiastical or religious, cultural, commercial, trade centers, uh, industrial, a new entry in the uh, late 18th century. And now the question is, uh, are we entering upon a new form of the city, which is global? Obviously, by the way, all of these were in combination with one another in varying degrees. But we're going to focus on, on the global. Um, first thing is to make a distinction, if possible, between the global and world or international city. As you know, in the 19th century, Paris was always thought of as the, the world uh, city. Uh, modern city, I mean, that's, these two things go together. In other words, the last two, three hundred years can be characterized as modernity. I mean, it's the way of thinking, obviously, uh, here. Now, the other word that uh, comes immediately to mind uh, today is megacities. So on one hand, you've got the modern city, or the international or world city, and on the other side, you've got something called a megacity. Now, a city, by the way, whether it's world or mega or what you will, can be thought of as an alternative to the nation state. 
I'm told, for example, in Zaire, which I know less about, in fact, than I do about Jerusalem, that the second largest city there is far more important than the government. I mean, that's where the, you know, the economic and the political and everything else power may be. So that's something to bear in mind. Well, what makes for a global city, uh, if we're going to introduce that new idea? Is it size? Um, there's a list of 30 global cities that has been put out by uh, a research organization based on size. Uh, Tokyo is at the top with about 22 million. Um, I'm just going to pick one in the middle, uh, actually farther down, which is Jakarta. Jakarta is listed as a global city with 8.6 million uh, people. Missing from that list, by the way, is Karachi. I don't understand how they compile the list, but Karachi has gone from 5 million in the last 25 years to about 14 million. But no one would think of calling Karachi a global city under the normal uh, ways of thinking about it. So where are we? Um, I think what you have to uh, reach for is what are the levels of globality for a global city? Now, if I'm not mistaken, you had Saskia Sassen uh, talk to you, and I'm sure you're familiar with, with her work. And as you know, she identifies three global cities, uh, Tokyo, London, and New York. And the main criteria is that, as she puts it, the more global an economy becomes, the higher agglomeration of central functions in a relatively few sites, that's the global city. So it's mainly financial services and what is attended to them and the networks uh, that uh, are aligned with them. Um, I, I, uh, Saskia Sassen's work, by the way, was pioneering. Uh, it's enormously important. But it does risk reducing the city to a mainly economic affair. And I think that's an error. There are many types of global cities. But let me touch on a few other ways of looking at a global city. One is uh, that advanced by uh, Bill Mitchell uh, here at MIT. Uh, you, I'm sure, are familiar with his book, The City of Bits. And for him, what you have are bits and spaces as against places. And I won't you know, go into the, any details of that, but that's an alternative uh, way of thinking of a global city. Um, there is an interesting, if I can find it, um, Photographic exhibit. This was in the paper just a few days ago. There's a photographer named um, Peter Bailobrzynski. And in his exhibit, uh, the New York Times had a uh, coverage of it. So let me read the relevant passages. The urban centers in Mr. Bailobrzynski's pictures flow together into a single fictional city more real than reality. By the way, the uh, the prototype for him is the city in Blade Runner, which most of you, I hope, have seen. For cities are no longer singular places, but nodes in the information network. Not a place, but a process, as Manuel Castells wrote. And you've had Castells here, is that right? Yeah. The megacities of Southeast Asia exist in these images as a fantasy that makes no solid distinctions between Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Kuala Lumpur. Bailozinski's photographs put a radiant, glamorous face on globalization and the invisible and powerful network that shapes our surroundings and virtually rules our lives. That was the coverage of that exhibit. Now, uh, as you know, if you go to these cities, sometimes you have to pinch yourself to know which city am I in. I mean, they're like airport terminals now. Uh, they're not completely distinctive. Place has given way, in, in a sense, to uh, that of, of space. All right, um, I'm going to conclude this part by suggesting to you that all cities are global today. They can't help but be, because they're all affected by globalization. So again, it's what I'm suggesting we have to look at is what are the levels of globalization uh, that uh, are involved here. Because, in fact, the whole notion of global city 
is a social construct. We've imagined it, just as we imagined the nation, and so forth. That doesn't mean it you know, doesn't have a certain kind of reality, uh, but it's a special kind of reality. All right, upward and onward. Or maybe the other direction. Jerusalem. Certainly, I mean, I've been to Jerusalem once. Long, long, long time ago, Conference on Science and Human Values. Uh, beautiful city, but I didn't really learn anything much about it. However, I took seriously Diane's charge to me, which was, one, this whole uh, seminar or class is design-oriented, I accept that. I can't say much about that. She said, one, what is left to bind urban societies if religion, race, class, or market becomes dysfunctional? Two, what conditions are necessary to establish a peaceful, vibrant Jerusalem? Three, how do we bypass the nation state? I found these very provocative, which is why when she asked if I'd do this, I said yes. Um, so now I want to move, so to speak, in regard to Jerusalem from its being a holy city, which it's always been, to its becoming a global city, uh, and hopefully transcending the nation state in the process. By the way, that Tony Judd wrote an, an article on Israel uh, in the New York Review of Books, which some of you may have read, or in any case you would have certainly found it provocative, in which he basically says that it's an, an anachronism. It's tempting to be a nation state, when in fact, and it is a nation state, no question about that. Uh, but to operate as a nation state solely as a nation state when we are, in fact, entering into a global epic, a global society. So that's something we can talk about. Um, Diane also said, be uh, utopian or visionary. Well, I declined to be the first. In fact, I submitted an article as to why I don't think utopian thinking is the way to go. But I do certainly think it's wonderful to be visionary, as long as you recognize that that's what you're being. Um, utopia generally means no place. As you know, it's not, not to be real. Uh, and it's static, both in regard to how we see ourselves, the self, and of the society in which that self is to be found. So I'm going to try and not be utopian, but to be visionary under the condition of a political situation which, as best I can tell, seems to be preventing globalization, but not only globalization, but a, a, a peace and harmony uh, in the, this particular space, place, if you like. But we'll hear more. I'll be corrected on everything I say about Jerusalem, I'm sure. Uh, by Menachem. Well, I'm an historian by basic training, so the one book I was able, well, there was a Wasserman book, which I did read too, but the one book I was able to get, uh, this is at the Library of Congress, uh, was by Ben Aria, uh, Jerusalem in the 19th Century. Wonderful book, by the way. So I'm piggybacking on that. At the one session I was able to come to, Naomi Chasen, who's here now, said, Jerusalem is different from Western cities. I don't know whether you remember you did say that. Well, yes, of course. All cities are different. Jerusalem may be special because I gather it was conquered 37 times. That's a little unusual. I approach Jerusalem in terms of modernity, internationalism, nationalism, and imperialism. I think those are the key words before you come upon it as in, in global terms. So, my brief little synopsis, not a, nothing original about it, but I think it's w worth remembering. As Ben Arya tells me, until about 1850, Jerusalem was a walled city. That's the beginning of cities, all cities, they were walled. And the taking down of walls is a sign of modernity. I mean, Paris was walled too, there are many, many other uh, cities. So, okay. Um, there were some modern houses outside that arose, and therefore you now have to talk about a new and an old Jerusalem. And I get very unsteady here. Modernity 
hit Jerusalem in the following ways. Around 1860, the first road was from Jaffa to Jerusalem, giving a broader reach. Around the 1880s, you have a railroad, you have the introduction of banking, hotels, uh, steamships for the pilgrims uh, who needed better transport. Jerusalem is a tourist city to a large extent at this point. Um, population that Benaria uh, offers is that it goes from about 2,000 to 15,000 in 1914. And today it's up around over 600,000. So it's, as with all cities, population growth. It hasn't got into those mega cities, of course. Hopefully never will. Now, the land for the new city was primarily bought from the Ottomans. It was bought by Finns, Russians, German Templars, Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox Church, you name it. And they all built hospices, charities, and some of them introduced modern education. So what we've got is a fairly typical picture of modernity hitting a city. Um, now, the new city became basically Jewish. And I hope I don't offend anybody by saying that one could see this as a takeover. And I think, of course, of, uh, and I'm not passing judgments here, by the way. I'm just simply trying to identify what I think happened. If you look at Vienna or Budapest after 1867, you will see that uh, when the Jews were allowed in to Budapest and Vienna, they, to a certain extent, took it over. Uh, I, I mean, the uh, medical schools, the legal schools, the culture, et cetera, et cetera, uh, out of all proportion to their numbers, uh, which, of course, as you might suspect, gave rise to a great deal of anti-Semitism and to a reaction, it's a very unfortunate thing. But it looks as if something almost similar, in, obviously, you know, very different in the locale, uh, was taking place in Jerusalem, uh, partly because of the Muslim toleration. Muslims were tolerant. It's hard for us to remember that now. Um, but um, from the se se second century to the seventh, Jews were not allowed into Jerusalem. When the Muslims uh, took it over in the 17th century, Jews were allowed uh, in. Uh, foreign capital was allowed in. Um, so it was because of this atmosphere, if you like, and I'm simplifying. Uh, obviously, the Ottomans probably wanted to make money, too, and, the, and all the other things. But uh, what does strike one, uh, especially in the present day atmosphere, is that the city was able to expand and the, the Jews to expand primarily because there was a certain amount of tolerance. Uh, we can look at that further. Okay. Um, next, internationalism. One piece of modernity is, of course, the nation state. In order for nation states to have any kind of uh, adjudications and such like, they, it, we've, uh, an international system was established in the 19th century in Europe. And if you wanted to be civilized, by the way, you uh, had to qualify for admission. History of Japan is very, uh, very revealing in this, this regard. Okay, what has internationalism got to do with Jerusalem? Thumbnail sketch. I gather the idea was first broached in 1841. Why don't we internationalize the city? I'm uh, sure you know there were all these religions and groups and everything else. Uh, it was revived again at the end of World War I, but then it became a British mandate. Uh, there were some riots in the 1920s, as the story is told. And then, of course, you have the UN coming in, uh, uh, which uh, uh, lasts until 1948. Uh, and then uh, this is a, I'm sorry, it comes in in 1948 to have a divided Jerusalem. By the way, that's my one personal take on this whole situation. I was escorted on a tour of Jerusalem, and my guide said to me, you see, 60 yards away, that's where the Arabs were. UN troops were in between. Yeah. What did the UN troops do? They simply let the Arabs come. So I, I got a, a sense of why the Israelis do not trust the UN. I mean, that's just part of their history. Um, in any case, um, after 1967, as you know, uh, the Israelis took over the, uh, the whole of uh, Jerusalem, although the Palestinian population uh, is, I don't know the figures, you'll check me, somewhere 30 percent, but increasing. Maybe now it's closer to 50 percent. Uh, 
their population has been going up much faster. Okay, another piece of the puzzle, nationalism. Well, there are two nationalisms, obviously. One is Zionism, uh, which had mixed feelings about Jerusalem. It became something of a surprise to me. Uh, the Zionist intellectuals, uh, secular and so forth. Uh, and the Arab, which is a, a, another later development in many ways. One has to remember that the city was a focus of nation building. If you wanted to build a nation, one way to do it was through the city. And that runs through all of European history in the 19th century. All right, let me summarize here at the moment. What you seem to have is a mixture of politics and religion in which, as I read the story, the politics is much more uh, important, uh, much more there. I mean, it's the politics that push. Uh, now, I, I'm sorry to say, there's a lot of support in much of history, including present day history, that religion is a means by which uh, politics gets realized. But that's short circuiting a large subject and probably not doing justice to those who uh, are, are religious minded. So what you're left with in Jerusalem uh, are two policies, the Israeli and the Arab, and three religions, because you know, this, this is the site for the three great monotheistic religions. But Christianity effectively has vanished from the scene. The population is down to 2%, uh, so it says. Okay, let me now bring it all together if I can. What if we try and be visionary, as I was instructed to be? Um, try and look at Jerusalem as a global city. Obviously not economically so. I mean, it's going to be tourist uh, for, for a long time, I suspect. But let's bear in mind, by the way, another city in the region, which is Mecca. Mecca has claims to being a global city. That Hajj. Uh, brings together people in an extraordinary way. It is a network uh, with tremendous ramifications. Now that doesn't obtain for Jerusalem as best I can tell, but it's something we could, we could look at it. So let's try and look at Jerusalem the way 19th century people had panoramas to look at their cities. You know, you stand out and you construct a panorama. Well, what, what, what will we see? If we take the global perspective, and I realize how visionary this is, we now have to conceive of a shift from Jerusalem as primarily a sacral place to a value-neutral mathematical space that is the space which we call virtual space. Well, how do you do this? And here I can only throw out some suggestions, and I'm sure in the discussion I'll, I'll be uh, shown how they're so unrealistic that it's not worth uh, going much further with them. But let me, let, me, let me try. What would be needed is to build a networked society above the existing society. Well, let's think how we might do it. One way is to donate computers. One measure of a global city, by the way, is how many computers, how many telephones and stuff do they have in there. I don't know the figure for Jerusalem and how those computers are distributed among the population. But it would seem to me it would be a good idea if you're going to try and go global to get computers in there, donate them. Because that's the only way that you might be able to create a public space. Uh, it'll be an electronic public space, but it will be a public space. Uh, next, why not a shared museum? Now, maybe there is one. As I say, I, I just don't know. But it would house. Uh, Jewish and uh, Islamic artifacts, art, and so forth, and do it. We've played with the idea, by the way, how do you move from the Museum of Modern Art to a Museum of Global Art, and what would that mean? We didn't get very far. But it seems to me, okay, what you need is some very, very wealthy individual who will endow this museum, and one of you will design it, um, and it will be above the existing society. The third is obviously architecture. I've mentioned the museum, but maybe there is all kinds of global architecture in Jerusalem. Again, I haven't been there for 20, 30 years, and I may be speaking out of ignorance. But certainly architecture is one way of transcending the 
local place. It's still local, obviously. It's got global doesn't float up here. It's, everything is local uh, when you talk about the global, but in a particular way. Next, a global university. Why not? In other words, have a university which will draw students from all over the globe. Now, obviously, you would want to have um, strong Israeli and, and uh, Palestinian uh, student body, too. But this would truly be a global university. And that is not, by the way, uh, so unrealistic. Um, Singapore has declared itself a global schoolhouse, by the way. They're moving toward that, right? But perhaps even more to the point is Central Asia. You know those Kazakhstans, those five stans? There is a very realistic project to establish a university, three branches in those five countries. In other words, it would unite those five countries. Um, the only thing standing in its way at the moment is a quarter of a million dollars. Well, okay, that might be what we need for the global university in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, lastly, because you see my vision begins to cloud at this point. I mentioned non-governmental organizations, NGOs, as a key aspect of globalization. Why can we not think in terms of an NGO or cluster of them which would convoke shared meetings of both the Israelis and the Palestinians, which would foster more of this dialogue that I mentioned is possible uh, within the electronic agora. Um, OK, now come back down to earth. Uh, I hope, by the way, some of you might be inspired to think of other ways of how do you transcend it. But now the reality. Are the Israelis going to allow me to build my global university? to build my global museum? I doubt it. Are the Palestinians going to allow me? I doubt it. I doubt it. But that's the challenge. In other words, you have somehow or other to get across to the peoples involved. And I know that, I mean, the religious people, and best I can understand this, are so entrenched. They, they've still got a holy city. I, I do understand the reality, so this may all be just an exercise, uh, of course. But if there is to be the kind of hope that globalization might offer to the region, then I think at some point you have to try to move from the holy city uh, to a, a global city of the kind I'm discussing. Thank you. Yeah, you want yours. Right? Okay, yeah. I was challenged, okay, by your presentation <clears throat> and I in order to appease Diane, I will follow your presentation and then get to my subject in a way. Um, and the, you introduced very interesting ideas, um, both on your introduction, um, theoretical introduction, and then uh, getting to earth with the vision. Uh, I will relate perhaps later to the uh, components of your vision and the uh, items. But first of all, let me relate to the uh, definitions or conceptions that you used. <clears throat> um, usually uh, what we have or when we define, it is the global versus the local and is some kind of binary contradiction between the local and the global. Now thinking about Jerusalem, at least we have three if not four components. We have the international, which I, uh, which I prefer to use rather than the uh, global, uh, expressed mainly by tourism and communication system, as you, you said. 
Um, and uh, this international profile of the city is inclusive because it brings in tourists from yeah. different sites, communication by communication system, different people uh, can uh, communicate and so on and so forth. The national is exclusive and the municipal is exclusive even further. Now we have to add to that because Jerusalem is also a municipal play, a place where people live and consume services and goods and, and, and there is a trade and everything. Um, now we have to add to that the religious dimension. And uh, in Jerusalem it is uh, in force because Jerusalem is a holy place. Now, holy place by itself has a binary understanding. Or, uh, holy means global, but very limited global. Uh, it is greater than the local by its holiness. Uh, it has its meaning and message to the believers of a certain religion, but it is a very exclusive definition or concept, very, very exclusive. It is holy only to Muslims or Jews or Christians, and uh, Jews, uh, or, or, uh, Jews are forbidden to enter, for example, Mecca uh, um, in the Temple Mount. Gentiles, according to Judaism, are not allowed to, to uh, enter and so on. So it's by itself, it's global only for the believers, but it's a very exclusive. And the place is also very local and, and exclusive. It's a, it's a certain place. So by definition, a holy place it cannot be global. And Mecca, it's, it's global only within the Islamic world, only. Now, and, and another, another profile of Jerusalem uh, which exists especially during the 20th century, uh, it is the contradiction between plain coast and harbor cities and the mountain cities. So the Mediterranean, typical Mediterranean city, um, a harbor city like Beirut or Alexandria or Haifa or Jaffa Tel Aviv is completely different than Nablus or uh, Hebron or Jerusalem or Damascus, um, uh, the cities on hills. Uh, they have completely different profile, completely different history and holy cities um, in the case of Palestine are to be found uh, on the mountains. It is very typical to, uh, to have a holy city on the mountain. And Temple Mount, which geographically is not a mount, but never mind, it, 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 is, not by, uh, it is not by a mistake, not by chance, that Temple Mount is on a mount. It, it, it is part of the concept. So this also something that we that limits the globalization of Jerusalem, the possibility to turn it to be global uh, or international. Or, uh, uh, and uh, we have to bear it in our mind when we, uh, when we write down any vision. So uh, th this runs through the modern history of the Middle East all around. Uh, the, uh, I, I know that geographers uh, like to speak about the term of space. Uh, I would rather use the term place. And uh, uh, the place, in, in, as I see it, is different than space because place is limited by uh, uh, boundaries and borders. Uh, and in Jerusalem and as in other cities, uh, that's not only borders or boundaries, but also frontiers, a frontier line. In my analysis, Jerusalem is a frontier city. Uh, it's not only my perspective. Uh, in the political geography, Jerusalem is classified the same as 
the same category of divided cities, frontier cities, polarized cities um, as Berlin, Nicosia, um, uh, um, perhaps also in Belfast and, and, and others. Um, we should bear in our mind that Jerusalem is, in my view, divided very deeply into two different cities. Uh, the division is deeper than Belfast, in my view, um, even deeper than Berlin, even deep, deeper than Berlin, because in Berlin, the both sides shared the same history and same language. Therefore, with the, the, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was very difficult, it was not very difficult to unite them. Uh, in Jerusalem, without a physical wall, we have a deep, deep division between the Arab city uh, and the uh, Jewish city. Uh, I would like to, 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 uh, to go through certain components of, of Jerusalem and, uh, and uh, relate to the way that these components were negotiated on formally and informally uh, and, and, and then to open the, the, uh, the, 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 the discussion. But first, okay, let's see what we are speaking about and if you want to put oh, okay so if no let's turn it okay fine no mine mine not yours mine oh okay okay is it better the cameraman, uh, you, you have the say. Is it okay from your perspective? Okay. Uh, what, you, what you can see here, the, uh, the changes taking place from 67 to 97, um, and uh, it's remarkable to see the change in population in the eastern city. Uh, I won't go into details why it happened, but the... Uh, uh, just let you know, uh, I apologize if Diane will give you some bibliography to read, but I related to the, to the development since 67 in my book, Jerusalem, the Contested City. In, in, uh, in conclusion, the Israeli boom of construction and tourism uh, after the 67 war um, uh, uh, brought about the uh, expansion uh, of, the, of the Eastern City. They enjoyed it, although it was not in purpose and was not pre-planned by the Israelis, and to, uh, to, to some extent it, it went against the Israeli wishes and, 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 and hopes. Um, now, the, uh, this is the old city here. This is the Temple Mount. This is the old, old city. And the Jordanian city was very small, something like, like that. This part was outside the Jordanian city, and then Israel annexed and created, uh, created the J Jerusalem that we speak about, and also the Palestinians speak about Jordanian as the Israelis defined after the 67 war, uh, which, uh, which is much, much greater than than uh, the Jordanian Jerusalem and uh, the, uh, the Israeli Jerusalem altogether. Um, but this is the term of reference. This is our term of reference. We don't have a different Palestinian definition of Jerusalem. And uh, uh, so we have to relate to the Israeli borders when we speak on Jerusalem as a borders, municipal borders. And we have to relate to the facts on the ground to see the uh, urban space and the, the, the suburbs of, uh, uh, and the, the Palestinian uh, uh, building and the uh, expansion of the city. And I will, I will show you in a moment how the city expanded outside the municipal boundaries. It became de facto greater than it, uh, 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 it was on, 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 on the maps. So the city has some uh, virtual borders uh, uh, as well. But this, uh, at, 
when, at, the, at the time of 67, the uh, demographic balance between Jews and Arabs, Israelis, Palestinians, was uh, 75, roughly 75% Jews, 25% Palestinians. Nowadays, it's 68-32. Uh, 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 for, for a while, at the, uh, at the 90s, it was 70-30. Now it's 68-32, uh, 68% uh, 68, uh, Jews. Um, so you, you, see, you see that, and, and one cannot ignore, when thinking on Jerusalem and vision, uh, uh, one cannot ignore that. Um, now let's move very quickly uh, okay take this uh -huh. okay so you see the blue in blue there are the, the these are the Jewish uh, neighborhoods the uh, yellow the Palestinian ones and the Municipal boundaries, annexation boundaries, goes here. Up, this is uh, this is Ramallah, the Palestinian city. Goes up here. The, here, the, uh, Israel hoped once to have an inter international uh, a, a airport, and uh, therefore it. Once again, this is the old city. This is Haram Sharif, and uh, these are here new uh, neighborhoods or set, uh, settlements according to the Palestinians uh, built uh, beyond the 67 borderline. Now, what you can see here very cut and clear that the municipal boundaries cuts Palestinian build-up areas here. It was a very interesting uh, socio-economic and political process that brought about the, uh, brought about that the borderline here became virtual, crossing sometimes one house or one room into two. Uh, and actually what we speak now when we relate to Jerusalem is about two different cities and at two different metropolitan centers. And I will relate to the metropolitan dimension shortly uh, after this uh, transparency. But you can see uh, what I would like to also to you to see is that the Palestinian continuity is from south-north mainly. The Israelis cross this road uh, relatively lately, in the uh, late 80s, uh, by building this neighborhood. But the Palestinians uh, uh, has here mainly uh, south-north, while the Israelis can go here east-west mainly, and build up area in the east-west. Uh, Ah, another, an, another very, very important uh, demographic uh, data. 10% of the Israeli population, in, uh, Israeli state lives, Jews lives in Jerusalem. 10% of the Palestinian population reside in Arab East Jerusalem. So for each side, 10% of its population is located here in this, in, in, in this area, in this metropolitan area. 10% uh, is, is a data, it's, it's not 2%, not 3%, 10%. And 10%, even without the city being holy city, it's a, it's a data that no one can disregard. No nation, no state, no people can disregard and give up 10% of its population. Uh, and the annexation is also problematic for Israel because Israel cannot digest one third of the, of, of, of the city residents 
and turn them to be Israeli citizens, or in other words, to digest 10% uh, of the Palestinian population and turn them to be Israelis and continue to claim that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish state and Jerusalem is a Jewish state. One, one third of, of, of a city of non-Israelis and non-Jews means that de facto you have, we have there in Jerusalem a B-national city and a B-national capital. So it goes excellent, excellently, it, it's, 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 it's fantastic if the vision is, the goal is to, ha to have a B-national state, a one state for two people. But if, if the view is division, independence, and so on, it, it cannot continue. It cannot continue, and, and de facto what matters is not the legal or personal status, but what's going on on the ground. And what's going on in, on the ground, as, a, <clears throat> as I said, is a deep division between East and West Jerusalem. I will give you just a few titles, few items, and uh, you can read in, uh, much more on, on, in the plenty of books that are on, uh, on, on modern Jerusalem. But there is a whole set of primordial identity com issues that divide East and West, like religion, nationality, history, myth, language, and then you have a daily life division in the city. You see here segregation in uh, neighborhoods, high segregation in neighborhoods, no mixed neighborhoods. You have different education system. You have different transportation system, Allocate, uh, allocation of, of budget, municipal and, and national services. Uh, build in uh, the Palestinians are deprived by the system and, and uh, this is built in in the system. <clears throat> Different communication system. No mixed marriage at all. A phenomenon that we, it, we, we can see in any modern city, in any global city, in any big city, even in Belfast. We cannot see it, we don't have it in, in Jerusalem at all. We, according to, <coughs> uh, to the historical evidence, there were, there, there were some mixed marriage were there during the British mandatory period. Not anymore now, as far as I know. Very rarely there are social relationships between the two communities. Uh, housing and building, zoning, status, personal and collective status. The Palestinians are not citizens, they are just permanent residents. They are not citizens. Political institutions. Very, very deep division goes and cuts Jerusalem into two and as I prefer to see this the situation that is here as two cities uh, where their faces they, their faces are towards their natural hinterland and st staying back to back not face to face especially at the time of this intifada, especially. To some extent, it, it was so also in the first intifada. In barracks, the intifada in Jerusalem, both 87, 93, and this intifada is, is different than the intifada in the rest of the, uh, of the occupied territories of, West, of the West Bank. But still, the intifada is there, and it divides the city, actually on daily life, and what we have here, two different cities st staying back to back, 
There are some economic relationship. I'll also re I, I wrote about that in my first chapter on Jerusalem, the contested city. I summed up the economic life of the, of the city. But it is in a way that, OK, I, I, I send my hand behind my back to the other side, sometimes into his pocket. Uh, and, and this is the type of economic life be, and, and relationship between between the two the, the, the two cities. That's the way I, I describe it graphically. Um, but not face to face. There is no uh, uh, no coordination and uh, uh, cooperation between between the two the two cities and the two entities. Um, okay. <clears throat> now, Jerusalem also became a metropolitan in a very uh, daily definition. A metropolitan, according to the geographers, is defined where People consume goods and services or go to work in a, in a, in a, on a daily basis to a city where they do not reside in. They commute to the city from outside, from suburbs, from different cities. And uh, this happened to Jerusalem West and to El Quds or, e or East Jerusalem, each for its respective hinterland. Since it was not so in 67, there were dead-end cities divided physically and dead-end. And they became now centers for bigger, greater community residing. And I relate after Oslo from this area of Bethlehem up to, up to Ramallah. The whole area uh, of the, this eastern side is related, connected on a daily basis, commute, consume in the, uh, here in this area of the city center. The same goes for Israelis from here, this going to a, a and to some extent the settlements. Now, the, the Israeli settlements <coughs> enlarged, uh, the Israeli settlements in the occupied territories uh, enlarged the, uh, the metropolis to the south, to the east, and to the north. And this is, this is a fact on the ground that everyone should relate to. OK, now, I, very shortly, I, I, I will relate to the main components that, uh, that were dis negotiated. The, uh, the point of departure was Jerusalem as a metropolitan. The concept was introduced by track two, absorbed by track two by both Israeli and Palestinian participants and professionals. I shared with you many, Isa. Thank you for coming. Uh, and was also introduced and, and, uh, and uh, uh, used in the official negotiation. Now, who rules the metropolitan? Uh, in all the models discussed, none of them suggested Palestinian rule over the metropolitan. Joint rule was suggested only by one model in track two and rejected by the Israeli negotiators prior to the, finance, the official negotiation. Therefore, all the proposals and, 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 and track two uh, this, were on an Israeli overriding authorities in managing the metropolitan. 
I, I can go into details, but I, I will move just, just to name the, 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 the issues, the topics. Each of them can be a subject for a different seminar. Division of Jerusalem, physical division of Jerusalem. <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. All the models uh, are except at the last stage of the official negotiation in Taba, ruled out any option of physical division between East and West Jerusalem, Arab and, and the Jewish cities. They, it must, both sides must accept that there will be two different borders, international border and municipal border. The debate was that the alternative were uh, where to put the borders, the international and, and the municipal, where the, 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 the division line will run. We need an international border. We cannot live without international border in the city or around the city or outside the city, at the, uh, the, the city entrance or the city's entrances because if we speak about two-state solution, not one state. That's the, uh, sorry for not mentioning that, it was uh, the one, the binational one state for two people uh, was ruled out for, from any track to an official negotiation. Both sides un are, were unwilling to have an open, city with no international border, it, at most at its entrance from outside, because, because of two reasons. One, symbolic, to express nationalism, to express independence, to express statehood, uh, and uh, it, is, it is important for both sides, especially, I assume, for the Palestinians liberating themselves after many years of occupation and now having the right not to let me, an Israeli, in. After so many years when I did not ask them whatsoever and I went in by car or by tank or by helicopter and, and, and they could not say, yes, please come in or stay out. Now for them to have a roadblock and a checkpoint and stamp my visa, it is a very, very important, psychologically very, very important expression of statehood and independence. There is also the security, the security elements. There are, there are many, we have many enough crazy people on both sides, radicals, uh, and uh, M many more radicals can come, can come from abroad on pilgrimage or tourist and so on. Uh, and each side is interested to supervise uh, who get in and, uh, and, and, and uh, to across the border into his own territory. So there is a need to have a checkpoint, a border crossing, as in any terminal, airport terminal, or seaport terminal, this is a must. Now, then the, de the debate is where to put it, and there is a, 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 a built-in dilemma. If we put the international border outside the city, it can be here between, uh, between uh, uh, for East Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem, or it can be in some place in the, on, in, the, in, the, in the West, okay? Then we divide the capital from its hinterland. It's a problem. The capital has to serve the hinterland, not to divide itself from the state. The, 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 it's, it, it's, a, it's a very, very problematic stand. For many years, the concept of open city um, ruled our mind. I will show you uh, the maps of Geneva where we 
change our mind. In a way, perhaps we liberated our mind, or perhaps we occupied our mind with a, a counter concept of dividing the city physically by international border. But for many, many years, on both sides, negotiators, and, and this is also a very interesting issue to, to study, we consumed, absorbed the Israeli claim for the need to maintain Jerusalem as an open city. And in my analysis, the argument for open city was a code name for Israeli annexation. Uh, it took us many years to get free from this and, and to <clears throat> bring up an idea of physical division between, between the two cities. Now, how to do it, where to do it, and so on, this opens a, a, a variety of ans questions and, and, and answers. Uh, another subject was, uh, or let's put it in, in Barrick, uh, a concept which was reject rejected on the threshold was a concept of city-state. To turn both the Palestinian city and the Israeli city to have two city-states with special authorities and empowerment by the states, very beautiful professionally, very, very beautiful concept, which no politician could accept. No decision maker can, can adjust and support only professionals fell in love in such a concept, but when it comes to politicians, especially city that is, the two cities that uh, that will serve uh, one is already a capital, the other capital in in, in, in making. It's impossible. It's uh, it's impossible. But uh, okay, it is there on paper. Uh, once we can we can go back to the to the concept. Umbrella municipality. If we speak about metropolitan, then uh, especially if we speak about metropolitan ruled by Israel or over, uh, Israel enjoying overriding authorities, automatically an umbrella municipality comes to the fore. Uh, there were several ideas how to build up an umbrella municipality. In, in which Israel, in most of proposals, Israel will enjoy <coughs> overriding authorities. It won't be joined and, and, and shared equally. Uh, only on Beilin Abu Mazen document from 95, uh, there was to some extent joint, but not 50-50 not division of uh, authorities. Uh, Therefore, the, sh the idea shifted from umbrella municipality to coordinating committee. Not, not, not to have an umbrella municipality, but joint, shared, 50-50 parity of a coordinating committee for the two municipalities and two divided municipalities with full authority for each over its uh, its territory in, 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 in most of the, of the papers, um, not, not in the formal uh, uh, negotiation. The formal negotiation in Camp David, Israel refused to let the Palestinians have full authority and power inside the, uh, the, uh, the old city, uh, all, over the Palestinian neighborhoods in the old city. There were different versions and proposals. Uh, at the last stage of negotiation and the, f the opening uh, position of Israel in, in Camp David where uh, 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 that Palestinians will enjoy a full authority and sovereignty only on the remote neighborhoods, not in the, uh, in the old city nor in the, Palest in the Palestinian uh, neighborhoods adjacent to the old city. It was very problematic to introduce to the politicians uh, the uh, modern concepts of sovereignty. The variety of sovereignty options that are open for them to use, um, but they were there all along the negotiations on paper uh, presented to both decision makers 
by, by, by professionals um, uh, and like joint sovereignty, um, divided sovereignty on certain locations, postponing the, this, the, the uh, issue of sovereignty, God's sovereignty, no state sovereignty, functional sovereignty, residual sovereignty, all these concepts are well developed in, 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 in a legal uh, in uh, literature about legal uh, aspects of sovereignty. Um, they were rejected, turned down by the politicians. They want to know, okay, here is my house. I am full sovereign here, and you are there. That's it. They know only the uh, conservative uh, uh, concept of sovereignty, and they are stick to this very, very old, we may say old-fashioned of, of sovereignty, but, uh, but we, cannot, we cannot argue with them. That's uh, very problematic. Regarding Haram Sharif Temple Mount, at no stage uh, of the official negotiation, um, nor in most of track two, just in the, recently in track two, the Wailing Wall was included in the Haram Sharif Temple Mount as one co a compound. Mostly, the, the, uh, uh, when we spoke about the compound and, 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 and uh, a Temple Mount, it, exclu it, it excluded the Wailing Wall, although both in Judaism and Islam, uh, the Wailing Wall is part and parcel of the compound, and actually the holiness of the Wailing Wall in Judaism and the Al-Burak in Islam comes from the, uh, uh, the uh, Temple Mount or al which is part of the Temple Mount. So uh, it was excluded and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, what was on stake was the uh, Haram Sharif per se, um, Temple Mount without Wailing Wall. Uh, no track two, as far as I could track back and follow track two, n uh, no, no track two paper uh, in the Israeli side, in the Israeli side, allowed or suggested changing the uh, the status quo in, on Temple Mount in favor of Israel, especially by allowing the Jews, the Israeli side, to build up a, a compound or a synagogue, a, a prayer compound or a synagogue. This was not suggested in any track two, as far as I know. However, by the, no, no track two suggested to provide the Palestinians full authority and power and sovereignty over state sovereignty on Temple Mount. In the Palestinian side, I assume that all, the, uh, all their track two uh, and professional papers uh, um, were on full sovereignty on, um, on, on Temple Mount. Now there is another, there was another co concept which I don't have time to, to introduce, but it is a very, very interesting concept which calls for a different long seminar. It's, this is the concept of the Holy Basin. It was, it, it was, uh, uh, it was introduced by, by, by professionals in, in track two to take, uh, to take the old city plus some holy places adjacent to, the, to, the, to it and title it Holy Basin and then to have a special regime for the Holy Basin and there is a variety of options open for the special regime, for this special regime. Uh, the concept was used, okay, or to be more precise, let me say misused, uh, went to far extent against what was designed and aimed in track two. It was misused by, by the uh, politicians who brought the, the concept to the negotiation table, I mean the Israelis. And they use it in order to further base their stance and, 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 uh, and policy to enjoy sovereignty 
on, on uh, or, or sovereign power or, or overriding sovereign power, there are different options on the area of the Holy Basin. No, uh, I won't go into uh, details. Um, now, let me show you the, uh, some, uh, how, how Geneva related to, this, to these issues. And I apologize that these uh, transparencies are only in Hebrew. Sorry, uh, but I will do my, my, my best. Now, you have here, I will go from, from uh, west. You have here, see, the green, green line is the 67, uh, is the 67 uh, border, but it marks the 67 border here. Uh, okay, the wall that Israel built, wall and fences system, that's the black in build, in construction. Uh, and the, the, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the part that already built. And here the, the black will connect. And this is a main road that uh, Israel uh, hopes to, to maintain. Now you see that the, the, this is the line of, of Sharon wall, or the Israeli government wall. And the blue here, the, this is Geneva Agreement map. This is a settlement uh, uh, in, the Israeli, in the Israeli discourse. It is Greater Jerusalem, but it is outside Northwest Jerusalem. Uh, now I will move. This is an aerial photo. It's, it's much better than the, the map, but also I have the map. Uh, this uh, here, the border will will be. This is, will be Palestine. This is a, a, a neighborhood settlement in Jerusalem. This will be Palestine here. All this Palestine. This is a Jewish neighborhood settlement. Now, we go here, and then once, once again here, you have, we have a road junction that we planned how to let Israelis and Palestinians divide this road junction and use each, each side will use part of it. Um, we have technical solutions here in this part. We went out for a tour uh, and, and planned how to overcome technically and allow both, both uh, uh, sides, both states, to continue to let the uh, Jewish residents of these neighborhoods here to commute and, and go to, 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 the west, to West Jerusalem uh, uh, as usual, as they do today. The principle is, let's take the principle that guided us is, let's see how the city function, how people behave on a daily basis, where they go, where they commute, how they do it, and then try to adjust ourselves to this and build on this, and not, not impose on the city uh, too much that contradicts what's going on on daily life. So if there is a division, let's go ahead and with the division. If people used to commute, let's let them commute. And the, the, the division in, in the city, or between the two cities, helped us a lot. This is, uh, here, this is Malad Domim settlement, to be connected and annexed to Israel only by this by this road. And, uh, and here to be Palestine. This is not the plan of, of the wall. The wall will go all over here. Here it stops. But then it will be built from here. It will go by that and, and cut the West Bank into two. 
Here we minimize the cut of, uh, of the West Bank as far as we can, but up to here, uh, or the aerial photo, it's very, very difficult to see, but more or less up to here, the road to this, this settlement is in a tunnel. So the cut is from here to here. This, this is the, the portion of the West Bank that will be phys physically on the surface cut the continuation from south to north. We, we, we decided, we don't have it here, uh, I don't have it here in the map, but we decided to maintain or uh, to keep the old city of Jerusalem as an open city. The, the, the walls help us uh, to suggest that, and uh, it, it was a very long and interesting debate among ourselves uh, in Geneva team, among each team. The Palestinians have their own debate, and we have our own debate, and we exchange views. The division was not between Israelis and Palestinians, but inside, I changed my mind several times, and so on, my, my Palestinian colleagues, um, regarding the old city, whether to go to a physical division even inside, inside the old city or not, how to face the, the security problems that, uh, that we have in the old city, in, uh, perhaps in, in times of religious pilgrimage of Jews or Muslims and so on. But in short, the old city within the wall will remain open, sovereignty divided. Jewish quarter under full Israeli sovereignty, the three other Palestinian quarters under full Palestinian sovereignty, sovereignty marked on the ground. Marked on the ground. And, uh, uh, but, 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 but the old city will be will remain open. Now, entrance to the city will be free. The Israelis will enter freely from three gates, the gates that look to the west, to their Jerusalem. The Palestinians will enter freely from their gates looking to Palestine. Exit will be much more difficult. A Palestinian could not exit through the Israeli gates in order to exit automatically. In order to exit through Israeli gates, he, sh he must show visa or passport or any other document that both sides will decide on. The same goes for the Israelis who wants to cross into Palestine or exit the old city from a Palestinian sovereign gate. So the supervision will be through exit, not entrance. Uh, there will be an international force inside, which is a, another issue, uh, uh, to compromise, to overcome problems when there is a clash between Israeli and Palestinian, and, and, and the, the two sides, police, are involved. Um, but inside the old city, free movement. Most of the time, free movement. I say most of the time because each side can unilaterally close its sovereign area without any notice up to one week. So if, if the Israelis find out that there is a pilgrimage of millions of, Palestine, of Muslims coming after Mecca and Medina coming to a Hajj, small Hajj in, in Jerusalem, they can close their part physically up to a one week. Any extension of the period should be further noticed. Okay, I know. Uh, the same goes on for, for the Palestinians uh, and, and, and so on. Now, we are busy now in planning our next stage of negotiation of the border system, border regime, border crossing, where the checkpoints will be, and, and we have initial thoughts on that and drafts. I would like just to say one, one concluding remarks. This proposal of, uh, uh, of Geneva, of having a physical border which which on, on, to some extent is also open. 
which is friendly for the users, which, which call to crossing, but, but crossing under supervision with many gates, with many gates and dif for different users. Uh, I don't want to go to, into details, but plenty of gates. Uh, this border can function, this division can function only in the context of peace, of peace agreement, final status agreement. It's impossible to have it unilaterally in a time of a war, in intifada, and so on. It won't work. It is a precondition to have on the other side a partner. Otherwise, it's impossible. It is an urban space, urban area, and if there is a high level of animosity, even without a minimum cooperation, everything will collapse, fall apart. So this is a, a, a limit to, to, perhaps this puts Geneva into a vision, but, <laughs> but hopefully one day uh, it will, uh, it, it will uh, materialize. Okay, one more, before you open the questions, it is not the perfect, it's not the idealistic solution and so on. Perhaps we, we, we must some change and so on. It is not the best, but it is the best that we could conclude on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to have the question, but I'm sorry we don't have like two days to talk about all these issues. So, but I do want to make sure that people get a chance to ask some questions. I'm, I know it's going to be hard to go beyond 7.30, so I'm going to be real, you know, strict with the questioning. So maybe we'll start with, start with two questions, see how it goes, and groups of questions for both of our speakers. So, uh, Dick and Yosef. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I learned a great deal. I was, I was struck, I guess, above all else by the multiple things that got ruled in and that got ruled out. And in particular, I was struck by the fact that of what was not ruled in, or what was not even mentioned, which was the basis of the legitimacy that you and your negotiating partners brought to these conversations. <clears throat> there was this sort of Manichaean track two that was ruling things out constantly. Who, from what has derived the authority of, of the track two, um, what is, from, from where do you derive your authority to make the kinds of deals uh, that you're trying to make? And uh, would it be helpful for, for us to have a, a, a fuller sense of the, the basic legitimacy for which all these, uh, all these decisions are being made? Yes, everyone has here's two, we'll do two at a time. The both, yeah. of, both of the speakers. Yeah, I want to relate to, 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 to Geneva again and to ask, uh, I think that seeing the, the map that just uh, show us, I think it's when you create, in fact, through this map, more gated uh, uh, in neighborhoods and more uh, barriers that you will construct according to this, we need millions of uh, square meters of uh, walls inside the city in order to divide it, etc., in order to, uh, to, to, to accomplish, uh, to achieve the, the map that you presented. I think Geneva, accordingly, Geneva is the worst thing that, that anyone can wish for Palestinians and uh, Jewish. So I want to ask, my question is, in short, through, through Camp David Tab and ending in Geneva, what do you think the Palestinians lose through this uh, process? In terms of Jerusalem, I mean, the context of the Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, okay, so the, the first question about legitimacy and authority. Track two, by definition, uh, get not legitimacy from a decision maker. Uh, none of them were sent officially, okay, go ahead, unofficially, here and there, the decision maker and the national, not, not the local, but the national decision maker, uh, roughly, he knows about that, okay, sometimes, uh, sometimes he does not know, sometimes he knows about dozens that simultaneously goes uh, back and forth. Uh, for him, it does not matter. He can deny. He's, he does not oblige himself to accept the, these papers and, and, and so on. Now, Geneva, in a way, is, is, is different by, 
introducing, bringing in uh, politicians, especially on the Palestinian side, active politicians, um, uh, involving uh, also the uh, Palestinian cabinet by, by that behind the scenes and, and, and so on. But the other track tools, very rarely the, the decision maker uh, uh, was, was obliged and, and, uh, and, and part of. Now, it happened that Jerusalem was a taboo to negotiate Jerusalem. It was a taboo. When, but, but both sides were obliged, especially the Israeli side. For, for him, it was a taboo. And the, uh, uh, the Israeli side did not prepare itself for the negotiation properly through state bureaucracy. Therefore, it called the track to people to give them the paper, to give them the data, everything. And here, a, a wide gate opened for track to people to insert their concept and, 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 and solutions and so on. Um, regarding the, is it, is it is it quite okay? okay. Now, regard, uh, regarding your question, it is not, it is, it is not that worse. If I, perhaps if I would go into details about the border regime and crossing and, uh, and show the gates where and how many for which purposes and, and we, will, we will complete the negotiation on the annexes and so on, uh, you will see that it's not that worse, but one data, all in all, all in all, Geneva borderline is 425 kilometers. That's it. All in all, in all, the West Bank, Gaza, the West Bank, the West Bank. Now, uh, the, the Israeli wall, which you said that it is the worst, the Israeli wall fences system, including Malé Domim and Kiryat Arba, it's near Hebron, it's 785 kilometers kilometers long, which give you some, give you some data to think th about, okay. Uh, and the 67 borders, there are 360, 340, something, something like that. So it's not that far away. Um, the Geneva annexation per stage of territory of the West Bank and Gaza Strip annexed to Israel is 2% only. So it's not that bad. Uh, and and the one-to-one uh, -one land swap in proportion, including Jerusalem. Jerusalem is included in the land swap. Now what the Palestinians lose in the negotiation um, up to Taba, not that much. Really not that much. Uh, if you take the Israeli rightist arguments, they, they are just gaining, getting more and more. <laughs> you sold out everything, I face the argument. Okay? And uh, the criticism that comes from even uh, so-called mainstream Israelis the Palestinians should get less than they, they, that the Barak offered them in uh, Camp David, so why you give them everything? Um, the, why, I, why I said that I can go into details about the, 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 the territorial negotiation and so on in each item and so on. The main problem is that, as Faisal Husseini said, we don't, do not create facts on the ground. We are the facts on the ground. So they are, the Palestinians, form up effect on the ground. And Israel has many, many difficulties to uh, adjust itself and to see the facts on the ground. And this is uh, all, every negotiation, in, whether it be it in track two or track one, is a process of education. You change your mind, you change everything. You do not, en you do not leave it as you entered in each side, even the American side. And it's a process of, of education, self-education, education by the other side, education by the mediator, and, and so on. And we have to, to see the facts on the ground and, and, and to, to some of our visions, or each side, 
has to say goodbye to some of its own visions and hopes and messianic hopes and, and ideologies and so on, and to adjust itself to the, to the, to the, to the, to the facts on the ground. And also the Palestinians. Uh, I must tell you, even in Jerusalem, some Palestinians prefer total open city. Others prefer full divided city, even in, in, in the old city. Uh, and sometimes the division goes between the Jerusalemites and the people in, in Ramallah. Uh, the same regarding the Israelis. Some, some of them cannot live with the idea that there will be a physical division in Jerusalem. But the, the, by the same token, they cannot live with the idea that there will be international border on the, on, uh, at the gates of Jerusalem to the west. So how they can manage, they, they, you, must, if you must face reality when you negotiate as, uh, on official talks, or when you do an exercise like Geneva, which say, okay, now we are mimicking as a real negotiators, we want to do, not to escape into principles. It is very, very easy to run away from reality into abstract principles. Many track tools were frightened by facing reality, professionals frightened by facing reality, and I, I, I include myself, to, to large extent, to most of the time, and we were afraid to take some tough decision, uh, dec political decisions, and therefore we preferred to go to some generalities, visions, abstract visions, and so on, in order to reach a very pragmatic and concrete proposal. It happens to so, so also the Palestinian side. I think we can, we have a unique opportunity to make Jerusalem international or uh, global when we embrace together the idea that Jerusalem is the center for the freedom of the Islamic religion and it is the center for the rightness of the nationality, the Zionism and the Palestinian nationality. And upon that, we worked hard to have this mosaic picture of Jerusalem. Uh, and we embraced the idea of uh, the open city, and I think it was uh, our dream to see it uh, true, so that Jerusalem would be the sun of, of, of the world. But then, you know, the Intifada came and it shattered this, uh, this dream, and we started talking about the divided city. But even as you talk about now Geneva, and as we talk about different models, I personally live there, and I see the situation. We're more, you know, going into the hegemony of the Israeli system in even East Jerusalem, looking into the confiscation of lands and the expansion of the colonies with the wall, while, you know, you're going to have, you know, clusters of Palestinian slums here and uh, there. And then, you know, we don't have neither open city nor a divided city. And then this is a recipe of more uh, violence, of more uh, radicalism in the, in the region. So how do you perceive it? How, how we can stop, you know, I mean, this reality? It's more, it's going towards more hegemony. Okay. Can I, I, okay. I want to too, and I, I throw my question on here, only because we're running late, and I have a feeling that was a very meaty and important question. I know it's going to be long. And so maybe mine is not so much of a question, but, but a comment. I wish it were a question, but I'm not so sure there's an answer to it. But what really struck me, I want to bring Bruce back in as well, because I think that um, in some ways you were, you were talking on very different scales, as you mentioned, the very local and the very global. But what's, what was striking to me is you both agreed essentially on one premise that was very troubling, which is a global city can't be a holy city. I mean, you both basically both said that. You use the notion of modernization, so you have to move from the sacred space to this modern space. And you responded by saying, well, we have to recognize that it's a holy city, it can't be a global city. But I still don't know why that is. Why it is that a holy city can't be a, why you can't have some elements of, of, of a global That's city. That's not what I said. <laughs> well, you did say that, that in your vision, you said we want this panorama to conceive of Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem as moving from a sacred space to a mathematical okay. All right. Okay. But I mean, you had an evolutionary idea of kind of movement forward, which is you gave a long historical analysis of how walled cities, religious cities, move to these modern identities. And um, considering that Jerusalem is never not going to be a holy city, why is it that we have to accept that distinction? the holy city can't be global. That's a different notion, I think, than international, but maybe I, I still need to know a little more about that. Okay. You are right. This is a subject for a different study. But I will follow Isa. Uh, I fully agree with you. I subscribe every word. We have, in, uh, just following your, uh, your note, we have in Jerusalem two unequal sites, not only uh, that's okay, one is occupier and one deprived, uh, but also two unequal sides in their nation-building stage. Well, the Palestinians just in the beginning of nation-building stage, especially through the city, as you, uh, 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 as you uh, emphasized brilliantly. Therefore, the powerful side should withdraw. I will use this, this, uh, this concept in order to let the, the other side, the deprived, to, to, to have the, its own space where it can build its own institutions, exercise his state building, and then build on that perhaps one day when we reach cooperation. Otherwise, I don't see it. I don't see it. Now, it is necessary for the Palestinian side to have this space, it is necessary for the Israeli side to liberate itself from the psychology of emperor, of the side who dominates the, the Palestinian side, and no coordination can emerge between even a, a joint a parity coordinating committee between two municipalities unless the Israeli Jewish side Educate itself, okay, the other side is equal in its status, in its power, and so on. I, I stop dictating him. Okay, that's it. Seven, seven thirty. Yeah, right? yeah, it says, see. Yes, it is. Do you have yourself? I know, I want to thank everybody for your patience for going so long here, and I hope to. Uh, Keep everybody on the mailing list if we have more events next year. We we'll continue to talk about Jerusalem. And uh, if we come up with a vision, an alternative vision, and another conversation, we'll be sure to let you know if we solve the problem. But I want to thank everybody for participating today and for hanging around for 7.30, and especially Menachem and Bruce for your thank presentations. You